Now once more I must ride with my knight to defend what was and the dream of what could be. the rest of the Orbis channel and today we're going to be examining the Renaissance or as we've titled it the Medici and magic or magic and the Medici depending on which you believe came first. As we fly over the great Italian city of Florence we're told that this is the birthplace of the Renaissance. But what exactly was the Renaissance and why do defenders of the mainstream account tend to cite the Renaissance as evidence as well documented history that all of these incredible and stunning architectural achievements that we see in places such as Europe were indeed possible. Well, let's examine what exactly was the Renaissance period. We have the Broad Renaissance, which was 14 to 1500 in Europe. We have the Long Renaissance, which was 1360 to 1600. And we have the High Renaissance, 1490 to 1520 in Italy. Strange, we have so many different definitions and so many different time periods of the Renaissance. And as we look at this very stunning painting in the Vatican, we already notice the unique intricacies of the architecture in the painting itself. So what's the point behind this? Well, this very painting, which is supposed to be evidence of the great achievements of the Renaissance, shows us that they were painting a building that already had very impressive architecture in and around the building. And we also see many individuals in this painting who supposedly represent the Renaissance, although who knows for sure. And then we see other odd reliefs. The strange thing about the Renaissance, it's where Europeans went from being technologically backwards to suddenly having capabilities. My goodness, that was embarrassing. For, for Robin Hood, for Robin Hood. But looking in the Vatican, in the actual chapel, and we did explore this when we did the Vatican exploration, we can see that there are very stunning works of architecture mixed with art. And I think the most important thing is that we've seen these reliefs and these impressions in the ceilings of many buildings, but not just in Europe, but in buildings across the United States. So again, this gives us the visual evidence that you can still go and see and corroborate on your own to this day that there was this advanced architectural capability. That what we have in the Renaissance might have been reflecting something different. Now a lot of us will get revolved around the whole concept that the Renaissance was fixed on very specific dates. But the reason that I highlight that there's different definitions of the Renaissance, there's different names, and there's even different regions, we're not even talking about that yet, that's affiliated with the Renaissance, it's hard to pinpoint it. We even have our first so-called world map. Now, the Urbano Monte map also occurred during the Renaissance, and this was the age of exploration. Yet, what really brought about the Renaissance? How did we go from just having people in Europe who were very uneducated and didn't know about a telescope to being brilliant, such as Leonardo da Vinci, who lived from 1452 to the early 16th century or so, we're told. Interesting picture of him, and he kind of looks like Gandalf, and you know, he even looks like one of the original figures on, on Mount Rushmore. And even here in this profile, this is another one of these individuals that we really have to wonder if they actually existed because we're told that Leonardo da Vinci was the polymath of all polymaths. Not a jack of all trades, but a master of all trades. Engineer, droughtsman, artist, there was really nothing this guy couldn't do. And leave it to Star Trek Voyager to waste the character of, or the actor of John Rhys Davies portraying the character as a holodeck image. And if you're not familiar with Star Trek, holodeck was basically holograms. They weren't even real people. But I digress. Getting back to the whole concept of Leonardo da Vinci, we're told that in his numerous intellectual pursuits, which, much like many of the architects of the 19th century, he seemed to have no limit to how many hours there were in each day. He documented everything. He did documentations of the human body, interior looks at human anatomy, as though it was just something easy to do. And he even did some really nice pictures of horses, too. What really stands out, though, about da Vinci and these other so-called polymaths is we're told that there's many different theories for why the Renaissance happened, but what really prompted it was this influx of money, this ideal of the population to be susceptible to change after the horrifying ravages of the bubonic plague. And here in this image, we have this uh, unique depiction of the Magi. The Magi come up a lot in the titles of many of these images and artwork from this time frame, but what do they represent really? And we, when you look at this image, what do you see? Let me know in the comments. And then it, everything's not all fun and glorious. We also have images of great disaster, almost as though they were depicting something that was recently recorded, but who knows for sure. Back to the concept of the polymaths, though, when we're going to look at a couple in this exploration. Why is it that we have Leonardo da Vinci 
who could achieve all these wondrous things, and including this plan of Emola, or Imola, which is interestingly enough, how exactly did he get this plan? It almost looks like he was floating above it in one of his flying contraptions that he designed. Was one of those actually a practical device that was maybe used, or was he just that good that he was able to extrapolate an image as though he was looking down on it from the air? And then even in some of his other paintings, we see what are supposed to be very idealized images. And yet when we look at the architecture behind them, we've seen those kind of structures before. That sort of block work and that sort of coloring. And not even in Europe, we've seen it in the United States as well. Very interesting. And then we have some of these depictions such as the baptism of Jesus Christ. Although in this particular image, I don't know why it is. Jesus Christ looks like uh, one of the characters from the movie Road Trip. Anyways, not to be blasphemous or anything, I'm just calling it like I see it in the artwork. The intriguing thing, though, about the polymaths is that while they had all these great abilities to design, create, and use all of their mental skills to no end, none of them were reputed to be great logisticians. In fact, it's never even mentioned. So I suppose just like the architects of the 19th century and early 20th century who could do anything and everything, they were just automatically assumed to be great logisticians. Hmm. Look at this image of this armor. This armor almost looks a little bit advanced for what we'd expect to see, or a little overly intricate for the medieval time period, although this was the start of the Renaissance, and the Renaissance was the transition from the medieval time period to modernity. At least that's what we'll be told. And you consider the concept of form versus function in armor, a concept that even the movie Sword of the Valiant got correct when Gawain was wearing very ceremonial armor and it didn't do a very good job of protecting him. As there's many individuals who just seem to quickly believe and buy that heavy armor was a myth because, you know, modern times we can produce armor that's lighter. What was really going on, though, with Leonardo da Vinci and his seeming prophetic ability to look in the future and visualize and conceptualize immense devices that seemed hundreds of years ahead of their time. It seemed as though he was divinely inspired, as some would say, and indeed that's how the Renaissance is explained. Here we have an interesting rendering and drawing of a womb. Although, is this really a womb? This looks more like an Axital tank from the Dune universe, courtesy of author Frank Herbert. What's really going on with all this? Was he visualizing what he was seeing? Was this really an anatomical study, or was this some sort of device? that kept some sort of human or human-like creature and raised it. Very strange. Some of the other images and drawings that you see from da Vinci are rather unique as well. Did they have more of an understanding of brain function than we're led to believe? Are there more drawings that we haven't seen? Or is this just all there is? What if the Renaissance, while it says rebirth, was really the time when our current civilization started to recover from its reset. What if this was the time and these were the many different individuals who were attributed all these wonderful achievements and it's really just repeating the same story that we had from the architect story that we had in the 19th and 20th century. Would that make a lot more sense? It's always strange to me that we have such broad strokes when we talk about the so-called chronology of the Renaissance because it's very ill-defined, and I recall it being a great subject of argument and debate among historians. And of course we know that historians are very professional individuals, and they always have a great idea of how they want to keep things objective. At least they say they do, until they come up with a certain theory, or they have a particular historical period that they really like, and then they develop emotional attachments. Ah yes, the work of the Last Supper. And this was considered divinely inspired, because by using the concepts of 3D drawing, Da Vinci was able to direct all attention from wherever you look on this work to our Lord and Savior at the very center. Very impressive. And it's something that endures to this day. Well, let's take a look at Michelangelo, 1475 to 1564. So, same time frame, a little bit later than Da Vinci, but all within that broad stroke of the Renaissance period. He has a very familiar look to him, though. I'm trying to remember exactly where I've seen that look before of Michelangelo. Oh, yeah. He bears a striking resemblance to actor Willem Dafoe. Or should I say Willem Dafoe bears a resemblance to him. And Michelangelo was another one of these wondrous polymaths. And one of the theories for how the Renaissance was able to come about and be so effective and successful is you have this great men theory. That there were just these individuals who were suddenly born, all about the same time, who had this plethora of tremendous capabilities. They were engineers, they were droughtsmen, or architects, as they called them back then. They were artists, and they had the vision and the creativity that's been unmatched since then. Now, do you really see anything that is 
unique in their birth or their upbringing that would give you the indication as to how they could do all these things. Because remember, Michelangelo also designed the wondrous aspects of the Vatican. And not only did he paint the Sistine Chapel, but he also gave us the wondrous dome on St. Peter. At least the official history tells us. And if you're interested in seeing that, by all means, please go back and watch the Vatican exploration. And even here in these supposedly divinely inspired artistic renderings that Michelangelo did in the Sistine Chapel. We're also told, though, that painting was not one of Michelangelo's focus areas, but he was just that good, and when someone challenged him to do it, he could do it, and he would dedicate years of his life to doing it. And then towards the end of his life, just as kind of an encore or a cherry on the top, he just decided he was going to design and implement the building of St. Peter's. Now, granted, he didn't live to actually see it constructed, but he had the plan. And that's all you tend to need is a plan. And does it really matter if it's a single perspective plan? No, absolutely not. Now, what makes more sense? That we're really going along with this renaissance that it happened exactly as we are told? Or that in reality what we had was a society, a civilization that was trying to pick up the pieces, put itself back together after a calamitous event had just occurred? Ah, there we go. That single perspective sketch. Clearly, this was all Michelangelo had to do. He didn't have to show how high it was. He certainly didn't have to talk about the logistical capacity to bring in the materials to Rome at that time to erect such a wondrous structure. It was just going to happen because he had a single perspective sketch. Some of the other artwork depicting the judgment and other aspects that are considered very divinely religious are quite intriguing. The other interesting thing about the, the Renaissance is how the prevailing Catholic authority at the time just decided to go along with it because official history tells us that Catholicism and the clergy especially were not exactly keen on embracing the Renaissance. And we see works like this and we're told that this is a revolutionary concept that Michelangelo came up with. But how many times have we seen pillars and columns and walls and wonderful decorations above windows and many numerous buildings across the United States and not during the Renaissance period, but the late 19th, early 20th century? So were all these sketches innovative designs or were these merely recordings yet again? Recordings of a people who had come back from their recent cataclysm and were trying to, as I said, put the pieces back together in a civilization that was destroyed. When we look at Florence, which we're told is the birthplace of the Renaissance, we see the mighty Florence Cathedral. Although, according to the official history, the design and layout and the start of construction of the Florence Cathedral was well before the Renaissance. And there are many other cathedrals across Europe that are well before the Renaissance. So did they really need a Renaissance to have the ability or the vision to build these wondrous structures that are both colossal and yet inspired artistically? And we will be doing an exploration of Florence, and we're going to take a closer look at this cathedral. It is very unique, and it is very beautiful, and we haven't looked at it yet. We think about the machinations of the bubonic plague and all the death that had pervaded Europe. And we're told that that had changed the mindset of many people. Because when you wipe out half the population, supposedly, of an entire continent, people are going to remember it. And I guess they're going to be more susceptible to change. Such as Dante here, who had given us Dante's Inferno. Interesting artwork, though, and depiction of many of these individuals. Because you notice that they appear to be wearing rather, how shall I say, uniform clothing. What exactly is Dante even wearing here in this image? Now, we're probably told it's an idealized image, but Dante's Inferno with the explore, exploration of heaven, hell, the inferno, going down to the nine levels of hell, seeing Satan at the pit in the middle, and then when it's all done, meeting your love interest in your life, and that's going to be the person in addition to a saint who could take you to heaven. Yes, Dante's Inferno. Very well broadcast and advertised by the church. And we have other scholars who were told started studying things because the other thing that was just remarkably picked up during the Renaissance was the study of all the classical works from antiquity, Roman Greco works that for a long time were told that the church feared these works and certainly didn't want the pervasion of these works going along in society at the time. Yet somehow it was reading these works and seeing what remained of these Roman buildings that, by the way, had always been there, at least if we go off the official account, that had inspired these wondrous works of art and the ability of these artists and these people of many talents of the Renaissance to be successful. Except, of course, for Florence Cathedral. They didn't need any divine inspiration there. They didn't need a Renaissance. They didn't need an Industrial Revolution. They were perfectly capable of building this magnificent and colossal edifice, and the tower included. So what is really going on? What really makes sense? Well, they explain it with the Medici banking family. The Medicis were the 
early banking family of Italy, and eventually their influence and power spread to all of Europe and they lasted for several generations. But in summary, what they were known for, they were the real patrons of the art. They were the financial supporters of the Renaissance. And so you have this nexus, if you will, of miraculous events all occurring at the same time. And that's why we say it's magic or it's the Medicis. It's both. You just had all these so-called great men who were all born at the same time. And then you had the mighty banking family of the Medicis. Hey, that uh, that's one of the Medicis, and he kind of looks like uh, Cosmo Spacely from the Jetsons, just with a bunch of hair. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just my imagination going off on me. But the Medicis had a lot of influence, they had a lot of money, and they were the original banking family of Europe, and they dominated many different nations. Lorenzo de Medici, for example, he was one of the civic leaders and the primary leader of Florence, and of course he was a patron of the arts and financially supported the Renaissance, and that's why Florence was really the birthplace of the Renaissance, because you had this banking family who had innovated great banking techniques. And let's talk about Catherine de' Medici, 1519 to 1589, and she's featured prominently in the recent TV series Rain, played wonderfully by Megan Follows. Now, interestingly enough, we're told by numerous different historical segments and studies that Catherine de' Medici was really the power behind the scenes. Yet at the same time, she was also quite functionally involved as being the de facto leader of France, and some even say the de facto leader of Europe from behind the scenes. Although things weren't all fun and games and joyful explorations and artistic creations, there was a lot of upheaval with the Catholic and Protestant conflict that was going on at that time, because the advent of Lutheranism and the Protestant religion was quite an affront to the collective dignity of the Catholics, which the Medici family was firmly entrenched on the side of, if you've heard that terminology before. So Catherine Medici and her role, hey, look at that, this is a image from her wedding, and it looks like we got a little lion there. Did they have a little pet lion that went around with uh, their wedding? You look at some of these images, though, and you're trying to figure out, are these actual historical representations? Because we're told this painting was done sometime after her marriage, and you know it doesn't really even matter who she married, because we're simply told she was really the person with the power, she made stuff happen. Indeed, it's well documented that she had an entire stable, if you will, of we'll call them spies, but people who would gather information for her. several well-cultured women who she would send out to seduce many of the men of influence, and that's how she would learn their secrets, and pulled the strings from behind the scenes. I'm not going to recommend the TV show Rain, but if you're interested in seeing it, you can see a very, how shall we say, an intriguing representation of Catherine de Medici. De Medici. Did she really exist, though? Mm, maybe. Maybe not. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, St. Bartholomew's Massacre, where we had the unfortunate uh, killings of many Protestants and their families. And supposedly this was on the orders of Catherine Medici herself, although recently there's been a lot of debate behind it. Now, what makes more sense? That we have this religious schism that's going on, and here's Catherine Medici herself, touring the devastation, gravely assessing the damage, upstanding queen and national leader stuff. And if anybody knows what that quote's from, let me know. But in this image, you can see that it paints the picture that she's a very ruthless person who is more than happy to have people killed. And there's numerous artistic renderings of this horrifying massacre, whether it's St. Bartholomew's Massacre or any other time that numerous people were killed in horrifying ways at the orders of the so-called absolute monarchy or royalty that were told ruled with an iron fist at that time. What it really boils down to with Anna Green Gables here, I mean Megan Fellows, I mean Catherine Medici, is that she was someone who did manage to pull the strings from behind the scenes. She was really the ultimate power broker across Europe during her lifetime. And on the side, she also supported the Renaissance because she was a patron of the arts. Unlike uh, Maximilian here, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, he looks very dignified in that image, nice hat there. He was aghast by all these attacks against the Protestants at the same time. At least that's what the official history tells us. So once again, we have conflicting accounts. He looks very regal and dignified, unlike Captain Stransky here. Steiner! Steiner! How do I reload? How do I reload? Yes, Prussian militarism at its finest there. Oh, and here we have Nostradamus. Nostradamus, whose predictions actually started off some of the actions of Catherine Medici, allegedly. I remember in the 1990s when there were many different prophecy shows that were talking about the wondrous quatrains of Nostradamus writing, talking about World War III, and then, of course, they pivoted. Let's talk about the oration on the dignity of man. Now, supposedly, this is one of the works from the Renaissance that talked about wondrous things, the 
idea of an individual seeking liberty, seeking knowledge. Really, there's some wonderful stuff written in this particular work. And yet, for whatever reason, while it's attributed to the Renaissance, it seems to have been ignored over time. In addition to many of the popes at the time during the Renaissance being, well, classified as just completely and totally corrupt. Now, I know that's a very absurd thought to think of someone in clergy, especially the high papal authority, being corrupt. But that's what we're told in the official history. So, as I always say, make of it what you will. Let's take a look at some of the architecture. What we're told is that in France at that time, there was also an architectural renaissance. Now granted, they didn't have any of these great polymaths of Italy, but apparently they had their own polymaths that just seemed to come up out of the woodwork because, you know, whenever you have a renaissance, you can just generate people who are ultimate masters of all trade, not to be confused of jacks of all trade. And when we look at some of these architectural wonders across France, and we're told that they were all designed and built during this time frame of the Renaissance, we can see some of the most intriguing and very remarkable architectural design, especially on the interior where we see these incredible reliefs and all this detail that goes in the ceilings of many of these buildings. Suddenly they were just able to do this? But remember, this conflicts with what we see when we look at the older cathedrals that were designed and construction started before the Renaissance. So what's the real story? And look at the interior in some of these very impressive buildings across France where you see some of the greatest beauty. Indeed, we haven't really explored the so-called bark style yet on the channel, but we'll be getting to it. And we're told that a lot of that was improvised and designed during the latter part of the Renaissance. And once again, another single perspective sketch, because you don't need to know exactly how high the buildings are that you're going to be building. You just need to have a layout, and a two-dimensional layout at that, because apparently we seem to live in a two-dimensional world, do we? You look at some of the other architecture, though, and some of the designing, and you can see what was depicted in the paintings earlier, and yet what came first? Did the buildings come first? Did the paintings come first? Did the ideology and the concept come first of the buildings and then they built them? Then they painted them? It's really intriguing. And then of course we see the old columns integrated with the wall, an impressive architectural feature that seems to be very advanced. But the other thing that a lot of people who use the Renaissance to defend the whole concept of, well, people just decided to start learning again in Europe after being unable to use a telescope, even nobility on crusades who resemble Kevin Costner. So why did they decide to embrace learning again? Well, they noticed that they had all these wondrous buildings from the Roman time frame, and then they started reading all the works of classical antiquity. And voila, you get a little bit of financial support from a banking family, the Medicis, and it's magic. It all just happens like this. This is all it really takes. Some of these palaces in France are just jaw-dropping to the jaw-dropping to this day. And you see it in the cupola and the very intricate design here of the roof of this wondrous palace. We're going to be looking at many of these buildings and exploring them in greater detail. But just for this exploration, we're just looking at how they classified all the columns. Here is the other interesting thing though about the Renaissance that a lot of people don't mention. They don't realize that Virtually all the accounts that we have, all the so-called official historical accounts of both the entire Roman Empire and the time of Greece, were found and published during the Renaissance, as though they were completely lost during that period of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, because remember the Eastern Roman Empire continued on until about the 15th century. Look at the geometric precision here in this dome, and looking at the palace from a different perspective and the advanced construction that you see within it. Now, we're to be told that this is merely the innovations of the Renaissance. Yet, ask the question, is this something that we could do today? Is this something that we could achieve today with the building materials? Let me know in the comments. Even the palaces in France that don't appear as ornate or as finely detailed are still impressive just by the virtue of their position and how they factor into the land and the water. So what are we looking at when we see these images? Well, it seems to be we're looking at previous civilizations. And indeed, virtually all the cathedrals, all the buildings that we're looking at, it cannot be explained by just saying, yes, it's the Renaissance, it's the magic. You have great men who could do everything that were all born at the same time. And you have the Medicis who figured out the magical tricks with money that nobody else in the previous history figured out, or they were all just too stupid. Of course, people were only stupid in the Middle Ages of the medieval times until they weren't. And then suddenly they were smart. It's magic. And quite frankly, that seems to be how the historical account reads. And when you look at these renderings and these drawings, again, you ask the question, were these what they designed or were they just recording what they saw? 
And if you think about them just recording what they saw, it suddenly makes a lot more sense. Because when you see these kind of reliefs and impressions and this sort of detail built in a ceiling, it's very difficult to explain that not only did they just suddenly have architects or polymaths who were available in vast quantity during the Renaissance, they also had the people who did the construction who could do it, or were we to believe that also the polymaths were the ones who did the construction too. Not only were they unlimited by their mental capacity, they were also unlimited by their physical capacity. Michelangelo built St. Peter's with his bare hands and did it in the last few years of his life. Of course, we're told he died well before it was completed, but don't let that stop you. You also look at some of the other works of art and you consider the type of people that you see being portrayed in these works of art. Now, were these idealized individuals from the Renaissance or were these depicting some previous civilization? Because when you see certain images like this, it does not line up with anything that we're told or we understand of the culture and the society at the time. We also have the numerous and ubiquitous images that we see depicting an idealized people. And the explanation will be, well, they were merely depicting angels, they were depicting deities, they were depicting religious representations, and they did it all the time on every single building, like the scales up there. But what What's really the story behind it? Why do you need a very complex stairway such as this on this palace? What's it really showing and what's its true purpose? Well, we've come to our theories before on the channel, and the Renaissance seems to be an attempt by the mainstream to try to explain why they have these wondrous and stunning achievements that don't make any practical sense. What's really the purpose behind the very complex series of portal windows there? Well, we have our theories with cymatics. Here you have the pediment, and you have these very complex columns that were built in this. And you're nobody unless you have a very big door, to quote Steve Martin from L.A.'s story. And it seems that was very much the case during the Renaissance, again, if we're to believe the official history. But then you also have these numerous palaces that also have the artwork integrated in the walls. And remember, that was also a styling that we saw, both architectural and artistic, in Art Deco. Which is a reason why we're going to have to go back and take another look at Art Deco. Now you're saying, well, Art Deco didn't come until the early 20th century. Yes, but we have to consider the similarities. It tells us something completely different than what the mainstream account tells us. It shows us something different. Here, even in the floor with the very beautiful tiling and the arrangement and the patterns. It's something that defies the explanation that we're given from the mainstream account. Here, with the pillars integrated in the wall and these angelic figures, at least what we're told are angelic figures, but could they be representing something else? And what exactly is going on in the ground in this image? You can also see it in the construction material. What's the exact construction material? Because we know, at least we have an understanding of what kind of concrete was available at that time, but it seems to be that there were far more advanced types of building materials that were available than we can even begin to imagine. And even just managing to build a building like this in the water with these arches, who could do this today with this kind of material that it would last for so long? And once again, no shortage of very large and ornately decorated doors. And what's that really reflect and what's that allude to? Well, let me know in the comments. What do you think the decorations around this door really mean? What's with the figure that's exactly above the door? And I appreciate the column and what looks to be bricks on either side of it. We also have the very height of monasteries, the beautiful monastery buildings. And this is one in Spain that we'll be exploring in due time. And we can see that was this really something built during the Renaissance? Or was this something that was built to overcome the reset and survive the reset for learning to occur? You might have heard of Robert Greene, the author of The 48 Laws of Power. Robert Greene's an author who supposedly has discovered all the mysteries of how to exist and flourish in our current civilization, and yet he uses many historical examples. And I will give credit where credit's due. The 48 Laws of Power is a very technically well-written book, as he justifies all his laws of power by historical example. And he loves to... So let's examine his 48 Laws of Power in a little bit more detail. And we notice that the very first law of power is never outshine the master. Isn't it interesting how that's the very first law? So I think that reviewer who looked at this book was quite correct when they said that this book was really more about fitting into a system. But is it really about power or is it about you forfeiting your individual power to fit into a system? Because the very first rule is never outshine the master. So it's admitting that there is a master. Now there is some good advice in it, if you will, although I don't know if I'd consider it advice, where you see things such as win both hearts and minds. So again, it all revolves around being overly concerned with what others think of you, that you have a master and that you're trying to fit into a system. Crush your enemy totally. Now that's good advice, but how often do we see that truly happen? It seems as though in modern times, when it comes to conflict, nobody ever gets crushed completely. Ah, protect your reputation. And there it is right there. 
overly concerned with what others think of you. And if you really think about it, this book isn't really about power, it's about forfeiting power. And while Mr. Green tends to use the Medicis a lot in many different examples as they had power, it really begs the question, does anybody really have power? Or if you go off of this book as the ultimate template, and yes, he says things such as create your own identity because you need a little bit of Orwellian doublespeak to really have this book make a lot of sense. Is he really talking about exercising power or forfeiting power to fit into an existing power scheme? Because if you think about it, isn't that exactly what the Medicis did? Did they ever really have any power? If they did in fact exist. Do any of the current influential families have power? Or what we think of as powerful individuals? Well, you just ask yourself the question, do they control their own time? And the answer is no. They don't have really any control over their own time. Their day, their week, their month, their entire next year is already dictated to them. We'll be exploring the Florence Cathedral and its beautiful achievements, again done before the Renaissance. Well, I hope you enjoyed this exploration. Thanks for joining us. Please like, comment, and subscribe. The Industrial Revolution, Recycling the Old World. The Industrial Revolution is often cited by proponents of the mainstream account as incontrovertible proof for all the wondrous achievements of our current civilization. Our age of plastic and disposability, our ability to rapidly construct incredible skyscrapers of glass and steel, such as the Burj Khalifa. Yet, we look at these buildings and we question... How do they really compare with the buildings of the past, such as the state capitol in Atlanta, Georgia, an edifice that was constructed in four years with very different construction processes, and yet at the latter portion of what we're told is the official Industrial Revolution, the second one that occurred after the United States Civil War. When you look at the opulent beauty of the Georgia state capitol, you ask yourself, which building would you rather be in, the state capitol or a glass and steel tower? Also, how do you explain these incredible carvings? done long before the Industrial Revolution. When people think of the Industrial Revolution, this tends to be the image that they have in mind. Vast factories encompassing small towns and suddenly the ability to mass produce many products. But what are really the causes of the Industrial Revolution? This is one of my favorite slides that a student submitted some countless years ago. And it's kept in its natural state. The revolution originated in Great Britain in the 1750s and continued in the 19th century. And why did this happen? It's a combination of factors. Population growth, agricultural improvements, increased trade, technological progress, financial support from agriculture and trade, and the favorable political and social structure, of course. But when we look at these combination of factors, and you'll find that the cause and effect of history is always a combination of factors, Consider the fact that the population growth came all about from agricultural improvements. Everything really came from the agricultural improvements. So we have to look at the agricultural improvements to understand exactly how the Industrial Revolution came about. Because we never had agricultural improvements before. Well, except for when we did, according to the official account. There are numerous agricultural revolutions that are documented in numerous different nations, societies, and cultures. Yet we're focused here on Great Britain, or the United Kingdom, with three main causes, the Magna Carta, the Rise of the Yeoman, and the Rule of the Major Generals. Magna Carta being the agreement with King John and the Barons, signifying he would not trot on their rights. Rise of the Yeoman, the real middle class, the educated independent farmers, if you will. At least that's what they'd say the Yeomans were. And then the Rule of the Major Generals, a period during the so-called Cromwellian era that only lasted about 16 to 17 months, where a major general had responsibility over an area. And the United Kingdom and the subsequent settlers of what became the United States didn't really care for this period. They saw these puritanical major generals as killjoys. 
Well, how exactly did this transition the United Kingdom or Great Britain at the time into a place where we could have an industrial revolution? Consider the plan of a medieval manor. Everything was based on feudalism, where you had a lord that owned the land, and you had people that were associated with the land, and they farmed the land, and that's how they produced the yield that fed the population. In fact, one of the great causes for the bubonic plague being so devastating was because of the fact that there was a famine due to the changes in weather. At least that's what the official history tells us. You can find supposed examples of how the land was divided back in that time, and you can see it's all centered around the manor and the house and the church, and the land was divided in terms of who could farm what. Well, because of these changes that we talked about earlier in Great Britain with the Magna Carta, which supposedly had a lot of effects on society, also the rise of the yeoman, and finally the rule of the major generals, it encouraged the farmers to take things upon themselves to improve things. And there were vast agricultural improvements, a result of which increased the population and suddenly increased demand. Now, it's one of those questions, though, as to what came first, the chicken or the egg. And you find that with the Industrial Revolution. It just happened to be a perfect confluence of situations that arose. And suddenly it led to this incredible industrial machine factory culture. That just seemed to really come out of nowhere, especially in the 19th century. It's always the 19th century. Why is it the 19th century? You'll find no shortage, though, of images depicting large machines and also depicting very large structures. It's an interesting aspect of the account, though, to consider how these large structures and machines themselves were actually constructed before even having the means or the abilities to do so. And most people will simply tell you, well, it's because people worked harder then. They were willing to put in the 10 to 20 to 100 years to build a cathedral. So why wouldn't they be willing to put the 10 to 20 to 100 years to build a textile machine? And, of course, you're saying that I'm exaggerating a little bit. Well, no, not really, especially not when you look at some of the advancements that you see that supposedly come from the Industrial Revolution. Yet we have many examples of societies and civilizations that had great architectural achievements before the Industrial Revolution. Well, then you'll say, and that is exactly how you can justify the building of these very large compounds that we would call factories, the large smokestacks. I was always completely blown away, though, even when I was younger, looking at many of the images of the Industrial Revolution and the very large machinery that was required. One of the aspects of it is that mass production and interchangeable parts, which were supposedly innovations of the 19th century or so, were told. Yet it's odd that the Industrial Revolution has such a wide swath of time. You know, it goes from 1760 to 1900. It's not a singular event. It's a combination of factors, and it's more of an amorphous event. And one of the things that always struck me about the study of history, and when you see this compound, you certainly get that question yourself, why is everything always so amorphous? And the answer to that will be is because we have uniformitarianism. In other words, the idea that things take a long period of time, and they always conform to consistent factors. Yet the Industrial Revolution has many separate causes, and you can see here 1750 to 1900. And one of the causes was low farm wages. People were getting paid poorly on the farm, so they decided to go work in a factory because they would get better wages. And we certainly know how well that worked out. That's what led to the rise of the union movement in the early 20th century, especially in the United States, but across the land. Science, of course, because science always explains everything. Rapid advancements in construction techniques. A demand for products. What exactly came first, though? The demand or the availability of the products? Another good question to ask. And then finally, mechanization. And mechanization is very interesting in and of itself because we consider the fact that most of the heavy machinery that we use today didn't come about until the early 20th century. When you look at other images on how people lived during the height of the Industrial Revolution, you often have images like this. It looks like squalor and some sort of post-war image. Then you contrast that with other images of these machines, and it's intriguing to me how things always appeared so unbelievably old. And yet this was supposedly new when a lot of these images were taken. There's also the other aspect of really dissecting the Industrial Revolution, and many people tell you we're in four revolutions. That there were four aspects of a revolution that completely changed our society and civilization. You have the first, which was mechanization, water power, steam power, that came from the 19th century. Now look at the second phase of it, mass production, assembly line, and electricity. Well, when exactly did that second phase really occur? Did it occur in the end of the 19th century? Was it really more in the 20th century? 
Well, what the official history will tell you was that the assembly line was around in the 19th century, but we'll find there's an example of an effective assembly line that occurred much before then. And we also have our questions about electricity. Finally, the third and the fourth with computer and automation and cyber physical systems. Yes, we've seen what wondrous advancements our cyber physical systems have given us in the 21st century. It's why our civilization has leaped so far since 2001. And perhaps I'm being a little facetious, and yet at the same time I'm not. Yet you look at these massive complexes and you can see these incredibly large machines that were all built mostly before what we saw as the second phase of industrial revolutions or the four revolutions, depending on who you talk to and what they call them. You see vast arrays of textile machines, building machines. You think of the whole concept of the assembly line and what people are really able to achieve. Vast wheels and belts and infinite machines and very large compounds and when you look in the official historical account, you'll see that many of these were established even before the United States Civil War. Indeed, a lot of these compounds with their smokestacks were established long before 1860. It was often said that the reason the North in the United States Civil War had such a decisive advantage was its industrial capacity. Then, of course, you go back and you look and see how people were living. It's very interesting, though, that you see what appears to be mason construction or masonry construction, some sort of blocks or stones here and yet the people living in what appears to be squalor and in ruins. This is also the darker side of the Industrial Revolution, and the official account does admit this, that this isn't exactly the best way to live, that you have labor practices that are exploitive. But I ask the question, are all these large facilities old world remains, or are they ruins? Things that were simply found across the land and repurposed and pressed back into service, especially as certain aspects of technology were made available to the population and released in a control format, allowing people to slowly bring things back to an operational standing, to where they could produce things that the society, that the civilization needed. You also find numerous examples of an unbelievable number of bricks, and we saw that most recently in our exploration of St. Louis. And of course the explanation is, well, they produced all these bricks because they had the Industrial Revolution. And on the note of St. Louis, steam power was very critical, and steam power considered to be one of the greatest outputs of the Industrial Revolution, giving you the ability to drive ships up and down the Mississippi or whatever river you're operating on, and of course the steam power behind our mighty locomotives. And you'll find many pictures of locomotives next to smokestacks. And let's also not forget the amazing achievement, which was done by hand, of changing the rail gauge in the Southern Railroads. It's intriguing to me, though, to look at all the pictures and the renderings of not only the vast complex, but the vast machines that just seem to come up from really nothing in the 19th century. And then we'll be told that the official account tells us that we get to the 20th century, and then the United States especially, but the rest of the world, is able to continue to refine its industrial capacity, leading to the greatest industrial output achievement of all time, which was World War II. Oh yes, a global conflict, a very terrifying thing, yet at the same time, this is what we had from it, the result. Well, let's go back to the U.S. Civil War and the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia, 1861. Now, interestingly enough, the North was stated to have a great industrial advantage over the South in the United States Civil War. Yet, one of the main reasons they said that they located the capital of the Confederacy in Richmond was because they had the ironworks. This was decisive towards producing all the cannons and many of the other aspects of using iron and keeping the Southern Army in the field and fighting. I always found it interesting how the Confederacy was able to start a government from nothing, was able to start industrial capacity, essentially from nothing, and also to keep effective forces in the field, fighting the supposed overwhelming advantages of the Union armies for four years, and fighting quite effectively in many places, although it depends what theater of the Civil War you study, and the Civil War is, of course, a very problematic account. You can find many examples of what the Tredegar ironworks produced that allegedly survived to this day. And I have no doubt that there were many things that they did produce, or they just had initials on them. You can also look at this rendering of the powder works. The powder works in Augusta, Georgia, which was also a very decisive industrial capability of the South during the Civil War. Well, this really existed, and yet it looks like a castle. Is this recycled old world? a facility that was found and repurposed to be powder works. Now you'll see on the caption in the bottom there that it was cotton mills, or became cotton mills after the conflict. So what came first? Was it built as a cotton mill and then repurposed into a powder factory, or was it a powder factory that was repurposed into cotton mills afterwards? There's a lot of conflicting accounts just with this structure in and of itself. And 
regardless of whether it was used for the stated purpose of being for cotton or for producing powder, gunpowder, which of course you needed for all the cannons and all the musket rifles used at the time, why does it look like a castle? I mean, think of it today. This could be repurposed into a high school quite easily. It looks like many of the high schools that we've looked at or some other facility or function. And why do you need to have three floors for a powder works or for processing cotton? That just never made any sense. Oh, look, it says 1880 on it. So we'd assume this picture comes from later, and it's why I always question the accounts that come with these pictures. This is George Washington Raines. He was the gunpowder guru of the South, also known as the chemist of the South. You know, it's a very intriguing figure, originally a U.S. Army officer who went to the Confederacy, and with his ingenious chemical know-how and processes, he was able to run one of the most effective powder companies in the South, and ultimately in the world, keeping Southern armies supplied with gunpowder. Quite an achievement. Here's what he looks like in his older days, so perhaps we can get the affiliation or belief that this was some sort of real individual. Now, did he come up with all this, or was this just something he had access to? And the Confederate Pistol Factory. Yes, it uh, looks like the farmhouse that I grew up in a little bit. Well, you can just turn that into a pistol factory. It makes sense, doesn't it? How many pistols did they really use in the Civil War? I always enjoy looking at some of these images, too, of uh, Civil War soldiers, because you have to think this was the output of all that industrial capacity at that time. And the Confederacy didn't supposedly have a lot of industrial capacity. They also had very limited and rudimentary trains, although... Conversely, we're told that the Confederacy effectively used trains in one of the first major battles of the U.S. Civil War, the Battle of Bull Run, and it assured them victory. You also have the recurring theme of people sticking their hands in their coats in the Civil War. Now, I'm showing a Confederate officer doing this because, I don't know, what's this really saying? This is an image of the Quaker guns. The using of logs as a deception, and it was quite effective. The Confederacy used it during the Seven Days Battles, or the Peninsula Campaign, that was commanded by this Union general, George B. McClellan. Apparently, McClellan and his generals and his army were very easily fooled by the Quaker guns, and this is how they explain the Union army being unable to seize Richmond. McClellan was a very controversial general, and he was never in good graces with the president. And, of course, we're told now, when we have our <laughs> new historical look at the Civil War, he really wasn't that bad of a guy. Ah, yes, more pictures of him sticking the old hand in the pocket. You always have to give that impression of conveying authority and presence, and it's always interesting to me that you have military officers who don't have all the buttons on their jacket buttoned. It just looks really, really cool, though, to stick the hand in the coat. Dear, dear, could you pull your hand out of your coat? Look, I'm comfortable with my hand in my coat. I don't know, maybe I'm being too rough on him. Perhaps it was the version of Al Bundy sticking his hand in his pants, and that was kind of uh, McClellan's way or every other officer's way of blowing off the cameras. Ken Burns is quite a fan of George B. McClellan, and he lamented in an interview about how he had to make George B. McClellan the bad guy in the Civil War documentary that he did. I don't really like to make anybody a bad guy. I really wanted to show people as they were. Yes. Well, other aspects of the Civil War, going back to the Industrial Revolution, is the achievement of constructing all the rifles and all these incredible cannons. I like how you have the individual there pointing the district, point it that way. But then there were also the aerial balloon corps that we had from the Union Army during the Civil War. Interesting that they had the availability of hydrogen and they were able to deploy those things, although, once again, it didn't result in a decisive advantage. And what's going on here with all these cotton bales just laid out all over town. How exactly is that efficient or making any sense if you're going to process and sell and move cotton? Then, of course, we see some of the vast industrial capacity that the Union possessed at that time, very, very large compounds with large smokestacks, and again, all constructed at a time when the Industrial Revolution was still going about. There's also the interesting capacity of the Union Navy to rapidly produce ships and push ships into service although we know that wouldn't compare with the unbelievable achievement of the United States producing thousands of capital ships in World War II. And 1859 here, Schofield's Ironworks. Great timing right there, just to have that in time for the Civil War. Another southern facility that we're looking at. And all the remarkable, incredible, and extraordinary cannons that they managed to produce. And you'll find no shortages of those. And clearly they had great destructive capability, as we've seen in the destruction photos we've looked at from the Civil War. You can still find some remnants across the south of some of these industrial facilities. 
and I always found it interesting that there were so many bricks. Once again, the old brick. The end of the Industrial Revolution. Heavy machines that didn't come about till 1890 to 1920, and the assembly line process. Now, why am I referring to the assembly line? Well, we don't believe the assembly line started until the 1900s, really. But you find the example of this Venetian naval arsenal that was running a production line in 1104. And official history says that this did happen. This is very impressive. And, of course, we have the old lion with the wings on it. I'm not sure exactly what animal that reminds us of. So, once again, something that seems to be bucking history... And you can still go and visit this Venetian naval arsenal to this day, and you'll find some very remarkable structures that were completed long before the Industrial Revolution. Also the fact that the Venetians were able to churn out galleys en masse using a production line, long before the United States Navy had many ships that it was building, whether it was for the United States Civil War or World War II. And of course, we think on the production line, and this is supposed to be an exception to the rule. Isn't it intriguing how there's always vast exceptions to the rule? Vast exceptions of things that occurred in the distant past, even though they weren't supposed to. Well, there's an explanation. Now, granted, we can't say it was the Renaissance, because 1104 was a little bit before the Renaissance. So, how exactly do you explain the fact that there was this kind of facility, with this sort of infrastructure, and the capability to run an effective production line? No wonder the Ottomans never stood a chance in the Battle of Lepanto. How can, you imagine, how can you match the production of galleys? Yet when you go around this facility, you'll see that it has the same intriguing architectural touches, and the explanation will be that a lot of this was added later. No, this wasn't all built in 1104. It was added over the subsequent years, even though they admit that the production line capability did exist as early as 1104. So it's yet another example. I really need to get and visit this uh, site in person because this is very interesting. You also have examples of architecture and geometric precision that is well before the Renaissance even. But, of course, we're not speaking of the civilization that came before that also supposedly had the capability, despite not having an Industrial Revolution. Looking at some of the renderings, though, of this great naval arsenal of Venice... You can see that they combine the infrastructural capability to make large facilities, these large buildings, that would of course just be showing up all over the United States in the 19th century because of course they weren't built, according to the official historical account. Yet you can see some very impressive towers and some very large buildings that seem to be facilitated to support every aspect of this naval arsenal. And why am I focusing so much on this naval arsenal? Because it's a prime example that the official account does acknowledge of having the ability to run a very effective production line well before the incipience of production lines in the 19th century. And, of course, if you go off of what the United States achieved in World War II, building thousands of capital ships in a very short amount of time. And, of course, and we remember what history tells us about how the Axis powers were always in great dread, especially Japan, although Germany refers to it, too, about waking up the giant and bringing the United States in World War II because they just knew that the United States had the industrial capacity. Well, perhaps there was somebody in the United States who had read about this great uh, Venetian arsenal and decided they were going to employ some of these aspects in the ship construction. Capital ship construction is very intriguing in and of itself because you think of all the materials that go into it. You also think of the fact in terms of what kind of training you have to have within your production crew and to run an effective production line to build ships that aren't going to sink. As we know, when one sails the high seas, one's more than likely to encounter some very difficult weather. And there's not any record of a ton of galleys being lost because they encountered bad weather. So obviously they were made to specification. All right, returning back to the output of the Industrial Revolution. The large machines that just seem to get larger and larger when you look at different pictures. And, of course, people say, yeah, it was because of the Industrial Revolution. We had a cotton-spinning machine that was very advanced, and it's because we needed it. We innovated it. Well, perhaps we did. Well, whenever I look at the pictures, though, I'm always impressed by how quickly all this was built and implemented. And we took a look at this dam near Keokuk, Iowa, on the Mississippi earlier. And this was built from 1910 to 1913. And at the time, it was the largest or the second largest dam in the world, depending what figures and what statistics you look at. 
While they were building the dam, they also built this very large power plant in Keokuk, Iowa. And you might recall from our earlier explanation that Keokuk is one of those towns that seems to buck the trend because while it was slightly over population of 10,000 at that time, to this day the town has a population of less than 10,000. So who exactly were they building this large power plant for? What was the real purpose behind this dam? I mean, today you think this would make more sense in the Quad Cities. And of course, it's right in that very amorphous timeline in the very early 20th century, 1910 to 1913. And by the way, they constructed this very long and incredible dam at the same time as the power building that we just saw earlier. Again, with all the genera generators and everything else. You also have a very convincing six minute long movie that shows some uh, interesting construction of this dam. So yes, there's a movie, therefore you have to believe that it was done in 1910 and 1913. And if you watch it yourself, and I'm not gonna tell you what to think, you'll find that there's the same questions with many of the pictures that we see. But come to your own conclusions. We also think of how the Industrial Revolution gave us the ability to do mining on a very large scale, such as pictured here, and the large mining machines that we now have. When you look around the land, though, in certain areas, you'll see that it appears to have been mined already by machines that had to be far larger than this one. Still, the colossal size of many of the machines that we do see pictured in the early 20th century and even the late 19th century don't seem to be very easy to explain. Also, the ability to move steam locomotives. We're told that steam locomotives were imported from Great Britain to the United States in the early 19th century, but how do they have the capability to really move them? Of course, we'll have artistic renderings of what sort of heavy machinery was truly available before the 20th century, and we also compare and contrast with what capabilities we were supposed to have with the Industrial Revolution. Well, look what Egypt was able to achieve in the Bronze Age with no industrial revolution. And the answer will be, well, they had forced labor. That's always the go-to answer. In fact, forced labor is really the cheat code prior to the industrial revolution. The venerable bulldozer, one of the real outputs of the industrial revolution. And we know that bulldozers are essential for all the aspects of construction. It's how we're able to build our modern steel factory so quickly. Oh, yes, a hamster wheel crane. I, I mean, a, a human crane, of course. Can you imagine getting in there and running in that uh, wheel? I know someone's going to patent that. And we compare and contrast that with the mighty hyd hydraulic cranes that we have now, the sky cranes that are involved in building all of our steel and glass skyscrapers that reach to the sky and are very durable with natural disasters. The Hanseatic League was in existence from 1200 to 1669, and they had no industrial revolution. Well, the Hanseatic League was a trade and commercial confederation of merchants that started in Germany. Yep, those Germans again. But it did include many other nations and many other ports. And these were some of the outputs that they had long before an industrial revolution. Some very impressive buildings with a lot of bricks. So how exactly do you explain all these bricks being constructed? Well, they worked harder. They were innovative. And as many residents of Cincinnati will tell me, they were Germans! So, where was this made? How and why? Y you can't say this was the Industrial Revolution and how many bricks, how many blocks went into these buildings. And many of these buildings are still standing today in these towns that they still call Hanseatic towns. Very intriguing consideration that such achievements were made. And of course, it's always, they didn't need an Industrial Revolution. They just worked very hard. Now, do you have any accounts of forced labor? Mm, not so much. The other explanation for the Industrial Revolution happening is because of the embracing of capitalism. And the Hanseatic League exists as an early example of capitalism. You're simply trying to turn a profit. Once again, though, they seem to have the ability to produce some very incredible buildings long before the Industrial Revolution with many different bricks and blocks. And, oh yes, they had some wondrous decorations and some columns. Now, naturally, the current account will tell us that many of these buildings have been renovated, and that's how they explain this away, as they always do. And it seems as though they're constantly renovating these buildings. And that's always a question as to why the renovation continues. Yet, if these buildings are left alone, they'll stand. Such as this one, where they explain away all these bricks because they had to renovate it, and it's rebuilt. But what's rebuilt and what's original? It's hard to say, and it's clear that it being hard to say is by intention. Well, no industrial revolution for Rome, perhaps the best example of a very old civilization from what we call antiquity, that was able to achieve stunning infrastructure long before any industrial revolution. Indeed, this bridge in what is now Spain is nearly 2,000 years old. 
So yes, those crafty Romans could build a bridge that is nearly 2,000 years old and you can still walk over it to this day. And we needn't talk about all the great aqueducts. And one of the other explanations for the modern Industrial Revolution, or at least the one in the 19th century, or whatever time frame you want to give for it, is the fact that they had access to great canals and better infrastructure. Yet the Romans and the Egyptians had and used canals that are quote-unquote very well documented. <laughs> and let's not forget the stunning achievement of Roman roads. The Industrial Revolution contradicts uniformitarianism. It defies constancy of physical laws, and scientists argue about this. The uniformitarianism, meaning that it takes a very long time, humanity being around in its current form for 30 to 100,000 years, depending on what you believe about evolution, if you believe evolution, yet it supposedly takes a very long time to change things. But the Industrial Revolution completely contradicts this. So what to believe? Once again, it's the very thesis of conflicting accounts. The Romans had stunning achievements that we can still see the remnants of to this day. It's standing up very well. And it's stated that only very recently we discovered the formula behind Roman concrete. We didn't know it in the early 20th century. We didn't have the capability to construct or build concrete or to mix concrete that would survive in salt water. Yet it seemed to be no issue for the Romans. And those wonderful Roman roads Roads that were laid over a thousand years ago that still stand very effectively to this day. Quite a stunning achievement for a civilization that never had an industrial revolution. And you'll find no shortage of Roman roads and the fact that many of them, we know they haven't been repaved and they don't have a work crew going out there all the time. But you can oftentimes still walk, ride your bike, or drive your car on these Roman roads and they're holding up quite well. Now, are they perfect? No, but... Compare and contrast that with all the work you see being done in your highway system, especially if you live in the United States, and you'll know what I'm talking about. But what do you think happened? Was it really a genuine industrial revolution, or was it simply old world remnants that were repurposed? And of course, we looked earlier this week at the Basilica of St. Peter and this great bridge in Rome. Again, all completed and constructed before an industrial revolution. Well, thanks for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. be impossible, sir. Things are only impossible until they're not. Yes, sir. Across the land, in every major city, in every small town, you will find numerous examples of libraries. Libraries, the ultimate repository of knowledge. Knowledge that comes in the form of books and periodicals and other publications that we believe and will use as reference and research material to prove a certain point. However, libraries may have a completely different story to them. Libraries may contain forbidden information that we are not supposed to access. And libraries may also play a strong role in the cultural building blocks of our current civilization. Let us explore and indulge in libraries. We begin by examining the quintessential library of Alexandria, Egypt. Supposedly, this was a library from the classical antiquity, representing the Hellenistic culture, the mix of Roman Greco civilization and all the wondrous achievements that they had. In Alexandria, Egypt, it was known for its unique, one-of-a-kind lighthouse and the library of Alexandria. There are many images and depictions giving us the example of the quintessential classical city, perhaps a city where there were mixed cultures and different aspects of society that gave it what people call the cosmopolitan appearance. And indeed, the story of Alexandria has actually touched our esteemed channel's scientific contributor, and he'll be delivering a little speech on it here. We have numerous renderings of what this library looked like, and we find this library an appealing sign of civilization because we believe that within its walls it stored numerous volumes, books of information that give us an objective account of the civilizations that preceded ours. 
And no doubt, this is one of the fundamental building blocks of our society and how we justify our existence and who we are. Because we know, or we believe, that the books and the publications stored within these great libraries are things that are objective. However, we tend to forget that an account, such as the burning of the Library of Alexandria, can be altered. Perhaps we do more research and we find out that the library was not really burned, but it eroded over a period of time. We have limited accounts from supposed contemporary sources that indicate that the library in Alexandria existed, and yet we're dependent upon over a thousand years passage of time to document that it existed. Let us suppose that the library of Alexandria did exist exactly as we're told, or perhaps it's even greater than we could even imagine. Why is this such an alluring story of this ruin of a building that appeals to us to this day? We're told that had this library survived and had its focus on knowledge continued, that humanity would have advanced much faster than it did, that this could have been a progression into the modern age, and it could have happened much earlier, perhaps in the 5th century as we currently measure time. These numerous images of this library give us the impression of great knowledge and learned individuals who know exactly what they're doing and made great scientific advancements. However, we're also told that their scientific advancements didn't reach the greater population, and as a result, many people had no awareness of what was going on in this incredible library. Consider the fact, though, that if this edifice did exist exactly as we're told, the amazing interiors. We can't really document the actual existence of the library in terms of a physical location. We supposedly have ruins that exist to this day, and we have some scattered accounts. What I find interesting, though, is that the very study and the story of this library does show us the true challenge in trying to examine history. What it's safe to say is that the perception of history changes with whatever religious, societal, or economic factors are in play at the time when one is studying history. It's certain to say that the perception of what the reality behind the existence of the library in Alexandria is, is predicated on the fact that you may have certain forces that wish to have a certain story or a certain outcome told. For example, suppose we are currently living in a society that uh, tends to have more of a male-based society than certain aspects of the female contributions. We expect them to be suppressed, or if it's vice versa. We don't exactly know what the true account is because we're reliant on people who had biases at the time to record it. We're also reliant on governments that we're told are corrupt and had numerous issues to store and transmit this information to us. So how do we know for certain that the information in this library is really an objective account? How do we know that the information in any of these libraries is truly an objective account? Now this is the more negative connotation with libraries. There is a more positive connotation. Consider if it were possible to transmit some aspects of an objective account, technological advancements, and even more so, the discussion and description of a society that existed in true balance. The destruction of the library in Alexandria, Egypt, was a very dramatic moment, and even though it may have been supposedly disproved by history, it's had a profound effect on our channel's scientific contributor. Yes, I was wondering when you were going to let me speak. Oh, go ahead, Carl, it's all yours. Thank you. I was wondering when you were going to give me a chance to speak. Alexandria was the greatest city the Western world had ever seen. Scholars, traders, and travelers congregated in the great harbor of Alexandria, and they exchanged information. In fact, this would be the first example of a cosmopolitan city. This is where we could say that people became citizens of the cosmos. But unfortunately, there were many religious zealots around at the time who did not appreciate the great learned advancements that the library and the scholars studying within it could offer the society at the time. And there was no one to stand up to prevent the Library of Alexandria from being burned to the ground. This was a great tragedy and a loss to all of humanity, because without these technological and scientific advancements, we were forced to wait another thousand years before we could actually achieve what we're supposed to achieve, and that's by reaching for the stars with our technological advancements. 
we consider the example of Hypatia, one of the great leaders of the library, and how she, as a woman in a male-dominated society, was able to flourish and ascend to a position of authority and technological advancement in a time when it was not proper for women to do so. Unfortunately, Hypatia was seen as a threat by these religious zealots at the time, and they rapidly descended upon her and the library, flaying her alive with shovels and then burning the library to the ground. This was a great loss to humanity. We can prevent this from happening now, though. We have to remember the story of the burning of the Library of Alexandria, and we must never let it happen again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Carl, for joining us. And yes, the story of Hypatia is very intriguing, as in reality, well, consider whatever you want on historical accounts, but in the 20th century, it seems as though they refined what actually happened with the library and the story of Hypatia in this movie portrayed here by Rachel Weiss. It's interesting to note that the Library of Alexandria was said to have eroded long before Hypatia came along. But she was still a leader, and I find this uh, artwork from the 19th century interesting, depicting Hypatia. Once again, a not-so-modest work of art from the 19th century, showing a woman in the full nude, much as the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Des Moines, Iowa. However, Hypatia did exist, I believe, but I don't believe that she represented some sort of reference to classical antiquity. I believe that Hypatia, whatever she actually looked like, whether it was Nastasia Kinski or Jada Pinkett Smith, was someone who was a survivor from a previous civilization, and that she attempted to preserve knowledge, along with her father, Theon. Hypatia and Theon were survivors of a previous civilization, and they legitimately were trying to preserve the records of that civilization. Yes, Theon. No, not that Theon. I think we have a better representation of what Theon, Hypatia's father, really looked like, and he's titled as Theon of Alexandria. Ah, that's better. Well, in any event, we have no idea what either one of them looked like. However, I think their deeds are what really tell us who they really were and what they're really about. And this goes back to the reference of what the library was. Official history says that the library was already eroded by the time of Hypatia. So the original edifice and the functional institution had long eroded. Now, who knows if that's true or not, because I find it interesting that when Carl Sagan gave his little presentation on Cosmos, he was quite certain that the library had existed and that Hypatia was actually one of the leading scholars in the library, if not the lead scholar. Consider how extraordinary this library must have been if it existed and it really was a surviving relic of the old world or the civilization that preceded ours. We also talk about adding or subtracting a thousand years from the official timeline and the account of this library and even Carl Sagan himself in Cosmos referring to this reinforces this notion that it's clear that there's a lot of alteration in time. There is a library in Alexandria, Egypt today, and this is what it looks like. And of course, we see the finest modern architecture that inspires our wonder every time we look at it. And yes, my sarcasm meter is turned up to 10. I wish we would have had more of a documentation of what the real library actually looked like. And why am I so certain that it existed? Because this is one of those touch points in history that we don't seem to really let go. And if there's something that we don't let go, then there's an indication that some aspect of what we're told in the account is true. I don't believe anything is completely fabricated. It's just it's always an alteration of the truth. This library did stand as an example of a pre-existing civilization. And Hypatia and her father, Theon, were survivors. Imagine what this library looked like in its fullest glory in the previous civilization. Aspects of information, storage, and recording that we can only begin to imagine. We're limited to the concept of both Theon and Hypatia and what they passed on to us, and yet there are accounts that they had access to advanced technology, such as an astrolabe or a star chart that we'll look at a little bit later. So what exactly was going on? Was Carl Sagan exaggerating a little bit? Was Carl Sagan pulling our legs in this account? Or was he pulling his own? I think there's an aspect of it that is true, because Carl was quite convinced that it was true, and he seems to genuinely believe what he was saying in his account in Cosmos of the Library of Alexandria and the story of Hypatia. We do have records of other great libraries across the land, and there are many great libraries that existed in the Islamic world, and many that still survive to this day. 
Regardless of what the exact architecture appears like, the function appears to be the same, that they preserve knowledge and that this knowledge was stored in the form of books or scrolls or many other aspects. Compare and contrast that with when we looked at the Tartaria Rises video when we had isolated monasteries or what we're told were religious settlements that may have been surviving settlements during an apocalyptic era brought about by a previous reset. And there are numerous examples of that across the land as well. There's even accounts of very extraordinary structures and depictions of such that may have survived initially the reset and then were targeted by the powers that be for their destruction. And it wasn't just the destruction of the buildings, it was also for controlling the information. Because as the saying goes, if you can control the past, you can control the future. If people don't have an understanding of what their true identity was from a previous civilization, and you're able to erase the great libraries of Constantinople, Alexandria, and countless others across the land, then instead of having people who are actually relaying objective information, as is depicted here, what you have are people that relay a controlled account. And then it simply becomes a matter of repetition, and suddenly that controlled account becomes the good word. And there is no denying it, there is no debating it. It's doing good research. And this goes back to the research fallacy that we talk about on this channel quite frequently. You have to count on the fact that the people at the time preserved the knowledge objectively. You also have to count on the fact that that knowledge was translated and passed on through countless generations, countless governments, and this is going off the official account, and that somehow it reached us objectively, that what we're reading is the true account. And yet we know, as an incontrovertible fact, that that is not true. That every account, that every perception of any account can be changed depending on the morality of the society in existence at the time. Consider all these images that we have of these unbelievably large books. These raise many more questions when we see these images of these large books. How could these even be useful for storage of information and passing down to subsequent generations? There are many theories about why we have such large books, and there's certainly no shortage of the number of them. So you can't really say that they were produced as some sort of novelty. We also have other accounts of scrolls, tapestries, and parchments from many different eras that supposedly communicate to us exactly what was going on at the time. There's even the famous historical account of how the Irish monks saved civilization by preserving knowledge. And of course, it's a great contradiction in our historical account that we're told that religious zealots destroyed the library in Alexandria and murdered Hypatia even though we're also told that the library eroded long before Hypatia came along and that she was simply someone who represented a school of thought that looked towards classical antiquity and wanted to represent it in a time of diminishing intellectual prowess. Whatever the true account is, though, we can't easily explain the fact that we have all of these large books that don't really make a lot of sense. Why do you think we have so many large books? Are we just all into this novel construction of things that don't make sense and have any practical use? Let me know in the comments. It's not just large books, though. There are many other facilities for storing and transmitting information through the time. The challenge becomes translating the language, and then, as we said earlier, depicting what really happened in the current society at the time. It's safe to say that a society that controls the civilization that it exists in will be very careful about what actual information is transmitted to its civilization and the people that reside in it. I mean, you can't have people getting wrong ideas of a pre-existing civilization that don't fit into the current time. And of course, it's always justified. We're well aware of this consciously, and oftentimes we just go along with this without any sort of question about what's really happening. Sometimes it's difficult to question an account that's given to us because there's the saying that people love a good story. And I'll admit that I'm guilty of that myself. I enjoy a good story, and it can oftentimes lead to an emotional upheaval when someone questions that story. Yet it's being able to overcome that emotional upheaval, which is what enables us to do objective research. And it's how we can achieve an existence as a true balanced individual. A balanced individual who's able to consider what the true account of our past really was, and not a biased or subjective account, because that's what we tend to find. We also have to remember that if we go off of our official historical account, this is all we have is many different biased and subjective accounts from many different eras. 
Many of these works do exist, and there are hard copies that you can find, and you can reference to this day, and you can attempt to translate them. But you have to remember that you're going through many different second and third hand sources of information. You're also going through many different means, many different apparatuses that are in existence to try to interpret exactly what you're reading. So it becomes very challenging. In fact, would you be surprised to know that the largest bookstore in the world is located in Iran, a nation that uh, we're told is large into censorship. Well, fortunately, we're not big into censorship in the Western world, right? <laughs> I was surprised to learn this fact, and yet at the same time, it's one of those conflicting accounts. The account of Andrew Carnegie, our great steel industrialist and philanthropist from the United States, one of the original robber barons who, once he was finished suppressing labor movements in the 19th century with the Pinkerton Detective Agency, decided in a bout of altruistic amity to devote his funds towards building libraries not just in the United States, but across the world. And we can see many examples of these great libraries that Mr. Carnegie built, and this one's actually in Edinburgh, Scotland, which is somewhat surprising to me that this was where the earliest Carnegie Library is located. There are others located all across the land, and they have quite an interesting architectural styling to them. And it suffice to say that virtually every one of these Carnegie Libraries is what we would define as an old world building. And wherever it is, whether it's in Scotland, the United States, New Zealand, or wherever else across the land, there's even some that we see in Spain, we see the same stylings of architecture. Here's the one in Spain that we see in other classical old world buildings. Of course, we'll simply be told that this was merely a reference to neoclassical construction at the time, but these buildings are not easy to explain given the architectural and logistical capabilities of the late 19th century when all these Carnegie libraries were supposedly constructed and some in the early 20th century as well. But you see the same architectural stylings on them and it's interesting that Carnegie's name is affiliated with thousands of buildings across the land, not just the United States. And as you explore this in depth, you will find that the libraries are not just on public lands, they're also with universities, and even with government installations. It's as though there was no limit to where this Carnegie plan actually went to, and what buildings it provided for. And when you look into this account, you'll see it's justified by this wonderful photo here of Andrew Carnegie himself, and they're laying the cornerstone. Ah, remember when we used to have accounts of laying the cornerstone for building an incredible building? Well, just imagine a cornerstone laying ceremony for thousands of these buildings. A viewer asked me a few weeks ago, where was the first Carnegie Library planned in the United States? Oddly enough, it was in Iowa, Fairfield, Iowa, the model for the 2,700 Carnegie Libraries worldwide. What is it with Iowa? It always seems to come up in these old world explorations, and it's more than a coincidence that the foundational template library for the Carnegie Libraries was in Iowa. Even though the first one was also constructed in Edinburgh, Scotland, it was based on this model. Nice owl there. And we always see that the owl and the griffin seem to be symbols that uh, appear on these buildings quite frequently. I'm sure that is just another coincidence but well, we know what they really represent. Fairfield, Iowa is the county seat of Jefferson County, which population never exceeded 17,000, and they built this really gnarly courthouse in under three years. Because once again, such achievements were quite simple in the logistical limitations of the 19th century. In fact, they even managed to put a bell tower on this one, and a little Statue of Liberty, which seems to have been replaced by, I don't want to say a cheaper model, but maybe we'll say a more expeditious model. And finally, we consider the film The Name of the Rose, a film which revolves around a secret library on an isolated monastery during the medieval period, or even the latter portion of the Dark Ages. The story concerns the adventures of William of Baskerville, portrayed by Sean Connery, a Franciscan monk, and his novice Adso, portrayed by Christian Slater, as they arrive at an unnamed monastery in northern Italy to participate in a theological debate between the Franciscan order, an order of the Catholic Church that believed in poverty, against the forces of authority in the Catholic Church itself and other religious orders about the employment of poverty and if the clergy, in other words, the administration of the Catholic Church, should be impoverished. 
It's based on the book by Umberto Eco, and he was supposedly inspired by this great monastery that exists to this day. And as you can see, the basic construction techniques of medieval times were employed in this monastery. It's also easy to imagine how one could be inspired by such a location. Yet at the same time, one could see how such a location could survive a reset, and it full well could be a center for learning. What the film The Name of the Rose really depicts, though, is a time of fanatical religious faith that overcomes the learned inclinations of William of Baskerville. William of Baskerville is a fictional character, but he is based on a historical character, supposedly. William of Ockham, famous for the saying, Ockham's Razor. In other words, the most simple explanation tends to be the most correct. However, just accepting the most simple explanation without asking questions kind of defies the principle of true objective learning and research, if there is such a thing. The film depicts many incredible scenes of old world buildings, and it does some great on-location shooting. What happens is, once William of Baskerville and his novice Adso show up at the monastery, they find out that there's an unexplained murder, and the abbot of the monastery wants William to investigate, as he's well known as an intellectual, the abbot pictured to the right here. Portrayed by actor Michael Lonsdale and F. Murray Abraham, portraying Bernardo Gui, a member of the Inquisition. You also have one of the esteemed members of the monastery, the Honorable Yorgi, who seeks to repress the intellectual pursuits. He also doesn't appreciate people laughing, because he finds that if people laugh, then they no longer have a need for God in their lives. So, you can argue that this film is the classic depiction of religious zealots that are preventing the objective search of knowledge. Another interesting aspect about this film is some of the sets that were constructed. The library itself is hidden in a great labyrinth in the monastery. Now, while there's a lot of location shooting in the film, the Great Labyrinth had to be constructed as one of the largest sets seen since the film Intolerance and other great set Hollywood films. There's difficult and conflicting accounts, though, but we can see that the set exists, and here's a map of what the labyrinth of the monastery looked like. And once again, I'm drawn to the conclusion of considering that these monasteries really did exist, and they really were some preservation of the old world of the previous civilization. Now, did they have to be overcome by the forces or the authorities that be to ensure that the correct information was transmitted to the current population? I believe that there's a very strong case to be made for that. And you can actually find a lot of that hidden within the plot of both the film, The Name of the Rose, and the book by Umberta Eco. It's an intriguing concept, though, the search for knowledge and what it really represents, and many of the challenges that we face. We see that William of Baskerville values the books more than people in some cases, and yet by the end of the film he's made a little bit of a character arc and he values people even more than the books. There's even an astrolabe depicted in the book and Habatia was said to construct these as star charts. William of Baskerville used it and it's actually used to condemn him as a heretic by Bernardo Gui, the church's representative of the Inquisition, played by the ever irascible and capable F. Murray Abraham. You might remember him from the film Amadeus, as Amadeus's arch-nemesis Salieri, the other composer. When you watch the film The Name of the Rose, you'll have references to how the monasteries could have been used to preserve knowledge from the old world, and how that knowledge was challenged. How much of it could reach us objectively? Let us suppose that there were objective accounts that were recorded in books or parchments, and that we had some means to translate them to contemporary times. Do we assume that everything that we translate is objective information or it's biased in some way, shape, or form? We have to assume that even from such a great civilization, the information could be biased. Consider this aspect. Des Moines means of the monks. Consider that Iowa seems to indicate that it's a preserved old world region. And that would be the origin of the name Des Moines, as I've been asked that many times. What monks in Iowa? Well, if you think about it, if there was a pre-existing civilization and there was a settlement somewhere that was of monks, it suddenly makes perfect sense. It could just be a coincidence, but then there's a lot of coincidences in these explorations. We consider the actual heights and ascendancy of the civilization that preceded ours, and it seems like it's some sort of dream in science fiction. Yet at the same time, we're told in our official account that the achievements of Rome and Greece and the Hellenistic period were considered science fiction to the unlearned minds of the medieval period. 
So as always, make of it what you will, but we can look and see with our own eyes that there were great achievements that previous civilizations had made. You can't exactly attribute the star formation, star fort, star cities, to the limitations that we're told that the medieval period supposedly had. We'll be examining how an objective account could have survived. Carl Sagan himself posits that there was an Encyclopedia Galactica. Now he was talking about aliens and other worlds, but the reality is there could be an actual remnant of some form of the internet, if you will, from a pre-existing civilization. There could be some sort of surviving software program, or dare I say, even some form of artificial intelligence that could have existed from the previous civilization and survived for our current civilization to access. We're going to be considering that in a subsequent exploration coming soon called Looking Glass, the ultimate AI. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at libraries and forbidden knowledge. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. History is full of people who, out of fear or ignorance or the lust for power, have destroyed treasures of immeasurable value.